Hello everyone. So welcome to IIT and Gate classes. So it's the continuation of our uh, video series on gas dynamics topics. So today we will be uh, discussing about very interesting topic that is a shock interactions and reflection. Uh, so far we saw the uh, oblique shock waves, normal shock waves and expansion waves. So what if I have a system of shocks um, in the same um, place? So what will they do? So, so far we only consider one single shock, uh, which is uh, uh, formed due to an uh, geometric uh, uh, arrangement or so. So today we are going to see about uh, what if there are two or four shocks, which are there uh, in the same system. So what will they do? So again, okay, so myself Akshay. So let us get on to the uh, topic of interest. So here I am showing a very interesting uh, picture. So here you see, I have a solid surface. Say like a uh, flow is moving through a duct or something like that. So in one face of the duct, uh, say I have a little ramp over here. So with an angle theta. So it is a geometric deflection I am having with theta. So the other side of the wall is straight. So what happens in this scenario? So does this shock, which is created due to the deflection angle theta, the oblique shock, does it end over here or does it reflect like this? So what is the scenario for uh, this to happen? So let us say I have M1, which is greater than one. So obviously it's a supersonic stream now. So the nature has to establish a way such that the boundary condition has to be matched. That means at the bound, uh, the flow has to be parallel to the surface. So that is the boundary condition it has to match. So to establish that one, what will the nature do? So usually what happens across the shock, we can see the streamline is going to be deflected due to the geometric angle theta. So here also it is satisfying that boundary condition, it has to be parallel. So after becoming uh, or deflecting uh, with an angle theta, so now the streamline, if it passes through, it sees an wall again, which is not parallel to its direction. So somehow it has to become parallel to the wall. So to become that one, it has to deflect again. But there is no geometric deflection to deflect, right? So now how it can establish such kind of, or uh, how it can um, counteract with the, this scenario. So in this scenario, nature will form a reflected shock with the upstream Mach number for the reflected shock is M2 and the deflection angle, what is the deflection angle it has to go through? The shock wave angle is beta, that is fine, but the deflection angle is again going to be theta. So how, because it is deflected by theta over here, the same amount it has to deflect to make it parallel. But if you look at this uh, very carefully, you can see the streamline, if I just extend the streamline, it is like this, right? So now it has to become parallel. So that means if I extend this one over here, right? So if this angle is theta, then this is parallel line and this is parallel line. This line is cutting to parallel line. So we know from our uh, elementary mathematics that this angle and this angle has to be same, right? If this is theta, this has to be theta. And again, if I have a system like this, we know this opposite angles are same, right? So if this is x, this is also x. If this is y, this is also y. So similar scenario over here. If this is theta, then this has to be theta. So we can easily see from the geometry as well. So this deflection is again going to be theta. What is my 
shock wave angle beta 2 so this one is straight forward beta 1 but what about this one here we have to be very careful the deflection angle as well as the shock wave angle both are measured with respect to incoming streamline so the direction of the upstream velocity so if i extend this one like this so this has to be my beta 2 very simple and this angle phi this is a different from beta 2 which can easily easily be calculated using the known angles beta 2 and theta because i know what is beta 2 i know what is theta so if i if i want to calculate phi the phi is going to be beta 2 minus theta right because this is parallel to this streamline so i want this angle this is same as this angle phi so this angle is this nothing but beta 2 minus theta fine so this we can calculate from the geometry but what is interesting over here is here i have a solid boundary that is why shock can reflect from this solid boundary so i will give you a scenario where i have say at the exit of the nozzle say it is uh, kind of uh, over expanded so it forms a oblique shock wave at the edge and there is a supersonic jet we have right so that is coming out of the nozzle So I have an oblique shock wave across which flow goes. So now in this scenario what happens this shock uh, can do a reflection. So in this scenario at the edge so here whatever I have is the crescent medium that means like this medium is not moving at all only at the core of the jet we can see the jet which is or the fluid which is moving so because of this uh, velocity difference we see a shear layer the shear in the sense so here zero velocity u is equal to zero and here i have u is equal to say u jet so jet velocity so because of this velocity difference one is having some velocity u j and other stream has no velocity zero velocity so because of this one there is a velocity gradient so that is nothing but there is a change in velocity across this edge of the jet so because of that one that forms a shear layer why we call it as a shear because the fluid over here will try to pull this uh, a fluid which is uh, away from the jet so that is why it creates the shear so this is the shear layer so this is called a free boundary this is also kind of boundary which is not solid boundary but it is a free boundary so in these scenarios whenever the shock encounters the free boundary say like i have a corner like this across which the shock is formed right so say like somewhere over here i have a free boundary like this here okay so in this scenario the shock hits the boundary but what happens does it reflect like this or something will happen the, or does it the shock is strong enough to pass the shear layer or what happens so in this scenario very surprising events will happen this oblique shock wave will reflect as an expansion wave whenever it sees the free free boundary not the solid boundary whenever it sees the free boundary it's it it reflects as a expansion wave say if i have corner like this so where expansion wave is formed and which is a free boundary then what happens this expansion wave will reflect as an oblique shock wave 
so this is very interesting scenario whenever a like shock interacts with the free boundary that reflects as an unlike shock wherever the like shock will hits the solid boundary then it reflects as the like shock say oblique will reflect as oblique expansion will reflect as expansion whereas in the free boundary oblique will reflect as expansion where expansion will reflect as oblique so this is one thing we have to keep in mind i am not going into the details of this uh, why it has to uh, become uh, expansion after the free boundary reflection and all so it is the thing we have to keep in mind okay so if if you are asked to calculate coming back to the original figure we are discussing about if you are asked to calculate the properties at the downstream of um, this reflected shock wave so then what is the procedure you are going to follow is like it's a very simple so first you are going to calculate the properties in region 2 from the given m1 and theta so this actually gives us what is m2 and similarly beta 1 we can get from theta beta m relation right so once i get the m2 this is going to be my upstream condition for the reflected shock so now i know m2 i know theta again from the geometry so from these two again i am going to calculate the properties downstream of the reflected shock that is at the region 3 so that is how we are going to perform the calculation if you are asked to do so okay so this is how the shock wave will reflect from the solid boundary that we have solved but we also know that when i when i see the theta beta mark relation right so when i draw the graph like this with beta being in the y axis and theta being in the x axis we saw for any given mark number it behaves something like this right so there is a location for given mark number for a given gas for which theta becomes theta max after which i don't see a oblique shock relation so what if what if i have a solution say like my m is equal to say some m1 for which i have certain angle beta say like my beta is uh given by the deflection angle theta 1 say so again look at the figure over here for this theta and this m1 i have some beta 1 for which i am going to get the straight oblique shock relation fine so now we know behind the oblique shock the sh mark number is going to be less than this one right m2 is less than m1 for weak shock solution for all our discussion we are going to consider the weak shock solution uh, as of now because uh, by uh, nature uh, usually the weak shock solutions will persist in most of the scenario so that is why so we are treating m2 is less than m1 now so now you see so i have the similar setup i have a solid boundary i have a solid boundary with some deflection theta 1 for which for m1 i am going to get a solution as beta 1 okay so after which i am going to get m2 so now this system is clear so now what if for this m2 which is less than m1 so that means if i draw the line over here for m2 this is less than m1 and for which this is already this theta is not now same as uh, sorry this theta is now above the maximum deflection angle for the given m2 so what if this scenario happens because now i cannot get the straight oblique shock relations because my theta for m2 for give, given m2 the same theta one whatever i am having 
it is not going to give me the Oblifrock relation because it's already greater than theta max. So in this scenario, what happens? This is very interesting part, right? So theoretically, we cannot approach for these problems because my theta beta mark relations doesn't give me the straight oblique shock relations uh, or solutions at all. So in this scenario, nature establishes a very unique system. So that is called mark reflection. So in this scenario, what happens? As the oblique shock forms and the shock approaches the boundary, so near the boundary, it forms a normal shock wave. So that whatever the streamlines coming here, that straightly, that passes, right through the normal shock wave and it gradually curves and becomes a reflection. It doesn't directly reflect like in the previous scenario, not like this. It is not going to happen. So in this scenario, so when it approaches the solid boundary, it becomes a curved and becomes a straight line. So or the straight shock, that means it becomes a normal shock wave and it gradually changes to reflection. So this kind of reflection is called a mark reflection. So this can happen when the downstream shock wave is seeing the angle, deflection angle theta, which is greater than it is maximum possible angle for the given mark number. So in this scenario, the mark reflection can happen. So this is one other scenario. So likewise, I can also have a interaction of shock wave. So just now we saw only the shock wave hitting the boundary and deflecting back. What if I have the duct, similar duct, <coughs> but instead of having one deflection uh, on the one side of the wall, what if I have the two different deflections at the two sides of the wall? So in this scenario, so by nature, what hap what should happen? I have boundary like this. I have boundary like this. So by nature, what should happen? The streamline should come like this and it has to go parallel to this one. Here it has to come like this. It has to go parallel to this one. So for that one, we are going to see two different oblique shock waves forming it. This edge and this edge. So say at corner G and corner H and say shock wave A and shock wave B. It is formed. But what happens? So this shock wave, whatever we are seeing from corner G, we call it as left running because if I see from the direction of the flow, so as soon as the flow passes through the shock wave, which turns towards your left. So if you are coming from the direction of the flow, so you see you have to take the left turn. So similarly, this is the right running wave. So here it, you have to turn right to move along with the flow. Fine. So now, because this shock wave, before hitting this wall, it is going to see the other shock wave which is formed from this corner. So in this scenario, very interesting uh, phenomenon will happen. So this shock formed at A will refract and become shock D. Similarly, the shock B will refract and becomes shock C. It is fine. But while doing so, what happens? Because you see like I have V1, it is same. V1, it is same. But V3 and here I have V2, the velocity V2 and V3. So in the magnitude wise, they are not same. V3 is not equal to V2 because the strength of this shock is different from strength of this shock because of the different deflection angle theta 1 and theta 2. Those two are different. So which gives me a different beta. So across which the flow will turn at a different way. So that is why we are going to get different magnitude of this velocity. Okay. So now once it passes through a region 3, then what happens? It is going to see the shock wave which is refracted from at point E. So it has to pass through this one. And similarly, whatever the V2, which has to pass through the refracted wave, this C that is coming from shock B and which has to pass through this one and it has to deflect. So because these two are having different velocities, so
so i cannot expect a velocity at region 4 and 4 dash whatever i have over here v4 and v4 dash are not necessarily be same so the magnitude of these velocities are not necessarily be same but the direction has to be same so but what is the condition which actually sets up this particular situation that is we are going to see a slip line so this slip line is going to make the difference that is like v4 and v4 dash are different so this is kind of a free boundary whatever i was saying earlier that is here we are going to see the shear layer that is a slip line so here i am going to see a different magnitude of velocities running through in the same direction this scenario is something like that something similar so if i have a splitter plate like this say some flat plate is over here above which you are blowing um, blowing uh, air at velocity v1 and below which you are going to blow with a velocity v2 with v1 greater than v2 so what happens once it comes out of this edge so v1 is having higher momentum than this one so you can see a velocity gradient over here so if i draw the gradient of velocity just use the different color so if i draw the gradient of velocity what i am going to see is like velocity is varying like this something like this so here i have different velocity here i have different velocity so because of that i am going to see a slip line or the shear layer right the similar scenario over here i am going to see the slip line but across the slip line there is one condition it has to match that is the pressure so pressure at p4 and pressure at p4 dash is going to be same or else what happens if there is a pressure gradient the flow will turn in this way or this way depending on the gradient of pressure like in which way the the pressure is uh, changing so that cannot happen by nature so nature will set up this system such a way that the pressure across this slip line is going to be same so if i take any line and if i measure the pressure at any point so they are going to be same so that is how it set up but not necessarily the magnitude of velocities direction is same but magnitude is not same so this is the interaction of shock waves so we can see this scenarios in multiple locations in a real or practical uh, uh, example so indeed i am going to show you a, a small video uh, at the end of the class so that like we can see this uh, complex shock structure how they come in uh, uh, a real life scenario okay so now we move on to the next part so here also i have a shock interaction this is not coming from two different walls separated at a distance of uh, some some height edge or something like that so here i have a corner or the wall such that it has two different bends so like initially it has ramp at theta 1 and again it is going to deflect with theta 2 so again what happens so once it sees the theta 1 the oblique shock wave will form so across which the flow will deflect with angle theta 1 so for this m2 again it sees a corner or deflection so for which it again has to form a shock wave across which it has to deflect and become parallel to this theta 2 uh, this is not exactly theta 2 uh -huh. so if i draw the straight line so i can make it theta 2 but for actual calculations i have to take an angle which is corresponding to this streamline direction and this uh, deflection okay that's fine but here what happens i am going to see two different system of shock two different oblique shock waves but because of these two angles are different so beta 1 and beta 2 are different beta 1 and uh, this beta 2 are different so because of that one so what happens so these two shocks can interact 
again at the interaction point they form a single shock system and becomes a shock d like this but at this interaction again i am going to see a slip line so here what is happening so these two will form a single shock in the meanwhile it also reflect back at this point so that when the streamline from here which is going to deflect with a different angle because it is not going to deflect at uh, not at theta 1 or not at theta 2 it is going to deflect at a different angle theta so this streamline and this streamline whatever coming here has to be parallel to make that one there is one reflected shock wave that makes this streamline to deflect reflect sorry deflect this streamline back into this direction so again at region 5 and region 4 the velocities are not same may not be same but direction is same so and it is again governed by this slip line across which my pressure is same so p4 which is equal to p5 so this is how nature establishes a solution for this type of system so this is all about shock reflection and interaction so now i am going to discuss a uh, little detail about the curved shock or the detached shock this is again the very common scenarios which we encounter in the practical application so that is why i brought this discussion up some some sessions back uh, i mentioned that maybe during the oblique shock uh, discussion that like when whenever the shock wave sees angle greater than detachment uh, sorry greater than the maximum possible angle that is theta max so then shock wave becomes detached so it detaches from the body and which stays ahead of the body so that is the scenario we call a uh, call that is a detached shock wave or the bow shock wave so we we can uh, we can call it in uh, different names okay but for this scenario how nature establishes the flow phase so that is an interesting part we are going to address so what happens in these scenarios is so say like i have m1 which is greater than 1 and which sees a blunt body for which obviously theta is going to be greater than theta max so depending on this theta value so the distance between the this tip of the shock wave and the tip of this body we call it as delta so this delta varies depending on the theta max uh, sorry theta greater than theta max value so whatever theta which is greater than theta max so depending on this value and the mark number so this this distance varies so when this theta becomes 90 degree theta becomes 90 degree this distance becomes maximum for the given mark number fine so now this is perhaps the one scenario where for a given mark number i can see all possible solutions of the oblique shock wave so we we saw this theta beta mark relation right so where we have saw the for a given mark number how this theta beta actually varies so this is one scenario in which i can see all possible solution of the oblique shock wave for a given mark number m1 so how it establishes is like at point a so it sees a normal shock wave so locally we are treating it as a normal shock wave so that is why like whenever we calculate the velocity across the pitot tube or something like that in the supersonic stream right so like whenever i insert the pitot tube so which which is going to measure the uh, pressure at this point the total pressure at this point so whenever i attach this pitot tube we usually see a bow shock wave and very um, uh, like in front of this uh, tip of this pitot tube we are going to see a normal shock wave locally so that is why we usually solve for normal shock wave whenever we see the pitot tube to calculate the velocity or something like that so we, what we do is like for given m1 we calculate the m2 behind the normal shock wave 
and we will get we can calculate p not one for this one and p not two we can calculate from m two and p two. So like that we are going to solve for p not two. So this one we treat it as the total pressure measured by the pitot. So that that is the very classic uh, way of uh, getting the velocity in the supersonic uh, flow field. So using the pitot field. So we have Rayleigh pitot uh, formula and all. So that that we can discuss in the later session. But so this is the scenario where at the right in front of the nose or the tip of the body we are going to see the normal shock wave that is denoted by point A. So in this map this is point A that is for the 90 degree case, right? So now as I move away from this point. So now what happens, the shock strength actually starts to decrease. That means still I am at the strong shock region. So you see here behind that I have Mach number which is going to be less than one, but it is not exactly, M2 is not exactly same as the solution for normal shock wave. So only at point A I am going to get behind this, I am going to get M2 that is from the normal shock relation. But after that, it is not going to be a normal shock relation, but it is going to be less than one. So till some point, say at point C dash, I am going to see the solution behind the shock wave that is less than one subsonic. So after which, what happens? So here there is a dashed line, right? So this is called the sonic line. So it is denoted over here, right? the sonic line. This is exactly the sonic condition at the C dash. I am going to get the exactly uh, M2 is equal to 1. So after that, I am going to get the weak shock solution. Till what point? Till point E. So at point E, it becomes like a Mach wave. Again, so across which M2 is not going to change. So M2 is going to be same as M1. So across the Mach wave. So it is just the, simply it is turning. That's it. But the interesting point over here is because from A to E, we can see a shock with a different strength through which the same streamline that is from like the, the magnitude and the direction of this velocity at the upstream is same, right? So that is why, so this streamline is seeing the shock of different strength. So that means it is deflecting at a different angle. So you see this streamline is deflecting at different angle than this streamline and then this streamline. So that means what is happening here is because of it is passing through a different strength. So the pressure field, if I measure at any line, say at this line, if I want to measure the pressure, so say at, at this region, P1, P2, P3 at different streamlines, all these are different now. P3 is not equal to P2, which is not equal to P1 like that. So that means there is a pressure which is varying in this direction. So because of this, what happens? It can create a baroclinic torque. That is, that is because of the gradient of pressure. So the baroclinic torque idea is uh, very uh, involved one. I am not, uh, perhaps I can bring in a little bit flavor of that one. Uh, le let us first uh, discuss this point, then uh, I will come back to that idea, right? So because of this streamlines deflecting at a different angle or it is passing through a shock of different strength at different location, the downstream pressure distribution is not the same. So because of this, the flow can have a vorticity or a rotation because of the pressure difference that can bring in the vorticity or the rotationality into the flow field. You have to be very careful here because we are still treating with inviscid flow scenarios. We are not bringing in the viscosity into the account. But still, I can see the rotationality. It is not going to be irrotational in this scenario because of the pressure difference. 
so this can this type of system can only be solved through a numerical technique not from a theoretical uh, i guess it, it becomes a bit more complicated if you approach from analytical solution so again similarly this part also like this mark wave reflection what we saw here right so this is also not easy to do from analytical approach so we have to rely on numerical techniques so similarly here also so it becomes a bit bit involved if you approach in the analytical approach okay so now this this kind of system can bring in the rotationality into the flow field not because of the viscous effect it is because of the pressure distribution which is going to be different so that will bring in the baroclinic torque yes so as i said earlier i can bring in the little bit flavor of this baroclinic torque so say uh this part like we have studied uh, in our uh, basics of engineering that so whenever the body is floating or something like that right say like this so we usually what happens my center of gravity cg and center of pressure will lie on the same line so that is the idea of the pressure distribution which is same the moment when i have a center of gravity which is still acting on the same line and the center of pressure which is acting on the different line okay then what happens there is a parity between these two vectors so the center of pressure is acting on different direction and center of gravity is acting on different direction so that can bring in the rotationality to this body or the torque in in a common term we use it as a torque that is turning more right so which can bring in the rotationality into the system so that's what happening over here so i have a fluid element like this say so here i have a different pressure and here it is experiencing a different pressure so because of this pressure difference it can bring in the torque to the fluid element or in terms in the fluid dynamics uh, uh, terminology it can bring in the rotationality into the fluid element so this is called a baroclinic torque effect okay so th that's i i think that is sufficient uh, to address this one i am not going into the detail of that one uh, i guess so it is sufficient for this uh, uh, class okay so to tackle this kind of scenario so there is a very famous uh, theorem called crocos theorem so what he did is so he used the idea of uh, thermodynamics so that is the second law of thermodynamics and the momentum equation to combine their um those equation to form a entropy change so t d s t delta s is basically given by delta h not the change in enthalpy minus the rotationality of the fluid element so usually in an in our discussion what we do is like we treat it as an inviscid flow field because of inviscid flow field so we usually don't encounter this term so we usually have t delta s is equal to delta h not from here only we actually uh, solve the uh, tds relation right like we use tds is equal to dh kind of idea and uh, dh we use it as cp dt kind of idea and uh, so we solve for this one right but in in actual scenario there is a part of rotationality that is also involved in the entropy change change in entropy is also uh, actually related to the uh, rotationality in the fluid field so this can come either through an viscous action or the special scenarios like bow shock wave where i have a pressure gradient which is creating the rotationality or which is bringing the rotationality or the vorticity so del cross v is vorticity right 
so this is twice the rotational rotationality so that's that's fine okay but in our scenario we treat this to be adiabatic so delta h not is not going to be uh, present so it is going to be vanishing but only effect through which there is a entropy gradient that is through vorticity and see here this delta s i am not measuring across the shock wave it is just the downstream of the shock wave i am talking about okay so still i can have the gradient in uh, enthalpy in the downstream itself because of the different uh, pressure uh, along the different streamline okay so that's uh, that's uh, sufficient for the uh, session so across the curved shock wave or the bow shock wave we can see the vert vorticity generation because of the pressure difference so if we, if we understand that one this is uh, that is fine okay so let us uh, um, conclude that one the flow field behind a curved shock wave is rotational as a result a velocity potential with all its analytical advantages discussed so far cannot be defined for the blunt body flow field consequently the flow field behind the curved shock is computed by means of a numerical solution of the continuity momentum and energy equation so this is not straight forward uh, analytical approach because we are bringing in the rotationality into the flow field whatever we discuss so far it is a inviscid rotational flow field so that is where all this analytical advantages are coming in right so whenever we solve for normal shock wave oblique shock wave expansion waves isentropic flow field everywhere we treat it as it is inviscid rotational flow field but compressible that is fine but now because of the rotationality which is coming into the flow field our analytical advantages so far whatever we used as a tool to approach our mathematical uh, solution that is not going to be valid so it becomes much more complex and we cannot get the straight forward solution for which we are going to rely on the numerical techniques okay so that concludes our part over here so let us uh, move on to few questions which is uh, asked in the previous year gate okay so this question is like a supersonic flow in a constant area duct at mass number m1 encounters a ramp of angle theta 1 the resulting oblique shock with um, shock angle beta 1 is then reflected from the top wall for the reflected shock the turn angle is theta 2 and the shock angle is beta 2 use the weak shock solution from theta beta m plot shown in the figure 2 to choose the correct option from the following very interesting so let us see so the system is given to you i have m1 which is obviously greater than m2 because across the shock m2 decreases that is fine it is deflecting because of the ramp angle theta 1 and i have a straight wall from which the shock is reflecting right so this is forming a beta 1 with respect to the flow direction m1 right so now what is happening so this shock wave will go like this the streamline and deflect and deflect and again it becomes parallel to the wall so we know from the geometry we already saw that right this is again going to be theta or whatever it is here theta 1 so now i have a beta 1 which is measured with respect to this one sorry beta 2 which is measured with respect to this streamline direction and the shock wave angle sorry shock wave b this this reflected shock beta 2 so now they are asking the relation between beta 2 and beta 1 so whether beta 2 is greater than beta 1 or beta 2 is less than beta 1 so that is one part and again they are also given the option theta 1 is greater than theta 2 or theta 1 is less than theta 2 so this is obviously not the right answers because we already saw theta 1 and theta 2 are going to be same so theta is same that is not going to change 
so but now we have to make sure whether beta 1 is greater than beta 2 or beta 1 is less than beta 2 that part we have to see so for that we are going to refer the theta beta mass relation say like i have theta 1 which is fixed right so the, now theta is same right so this is not going to change but say this is my m1 this is my m2 so this is how the graph looks like so now you see for m1 for this theta i have beta somewhere over here beta 1 for this one i have beta which is somewhere over here beta 2 so from here we can easily see beta 2 is actually greater than beta 1 so if i look at the option which of this is correct option a is not correct because it says beta 1 is greater than beta 2 it is wrong so the only possible option is this one option b for this one option b is correct okay so now i have uh, another question from gate 2008 an irrotational and inviscid flow can become rotational on passing through a this one we just now discussed so irrotational and inviscid flow can become rotational on passing through curved shock wave right all other scenarios are still uh, irrotational flow field so for curved shock wave we saw because of the pressure gradient it can become a rotational so now as i said earlier so i am going to show you a small video on the this a practical scenario or it, it is it is not exactly the practical scenario it is still the research uh, model uh, being tested over here but we can see the complexity of the uh, flow field right so when the shock shock interacts each other We are going to discuss about layering techniques and all when it comes to uh, flow visualization. Right now, we just concentrate on the uh, flow field around the body. You see here. So here I have a clean uh, attached shock wave in front of the body. The moment when I increase the theta, say like this is my center line. So and if I increase it to uh, 90 degree so it become a detached shock wave with the shock detachment distance like this now if i combine these two bodies so what they are seeing we are going to see the interaction between these shock waves so you can also see there is a very interesting interest intersection where the interaction of shock wave is producing a, a risk a flow structure okay so this part we are not really interested to see uh, for this particular session so i wanted to sh show you the interaction of the shock system can bring in a rich flow structure so which is indeed a very important for a practical design say because you see here this at the intersection there is a shock wave which is again formed and which is coming here and impinging on the body so this this is where the practical uh, um, point of view comes into picture because when the shock hits this surface it is not just the shock which is hitting which also brings in locally increased temperature and the pressure right so there is a load which is actually coming with the shock wave so we know across the shock wave there is an increase in pressure and temperature and all so the moment when there is a shock wave which is constantly hits on the given local surface so at that point locally we can see a, a thermal uh, loading or the pressure loading so which can be very vital for a uh, many engineering application and this scenario is a very common in many engineering application you can see a aircraft or something like that there is a, a different structures which is going to deflect the shock waves at different uh, angles and all so that can easily bring in the impingement of the shock waves or the or the other way so which can become a very important for uh, important consideration for the um, 
designer. So indeed, like X51, this that that actually faced uh, this particular problem through this uh, thermal loading or something like it actually be, um, deteriorated in the first uh, trial. So then they uh, come up with a solution or something like that. But it, it was a very major issue at that time, right? So this this can be um, very important for the design point of view. Okay. Okay. So this this particular video uh, basically gave us an idea that like how how uh, how rich this uh, can be when when there is a shock shock interaction or shock uh, um, reflections and all. Okay. So. Coming back to our discussion. So this concludes our discussion on shock reflections and shock interactions. And for more information, you guys can contact us uh, in IIT and Gate classes. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, listening to this session. So we'll conclude over here.